Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Toyota 2ZR FXE engine and how it works. Now this is a 1.8 liter four cylinder engine found in the Toyota Prius. This one's out of the Lexus CT200H and it had 290,000 kilometers on it with, you guessed it, blown head gaskets. Now not only is blown head gaskets a big issue, but these also drink a lot of oil. So we're going to tear this down to see just what causes the failure. Taking a look around this engine, you can see everything's made of aluminum. The block, the head, even the valve cover and the timing covers are made of aluminum. There's no plastic there. We do, however, have an electric water pump. Now this engine also has port injection only. This is basically an Atkinson cycle version of the 1.8 Corolla engine that we know and love. However, it barely makes like 100 horsepower. Now across the back here, we have your EGR valve and its cooler, which is also problematic on these. You have your typical coil on plug at the top here, and this engine takes zero W20 weight oil. I'll start at the top of the engine here by removing your coil pack. Pretty clean. Now what also is a downgrade is that this engine only has single variable valve timing on the intake side. Remove the oil control valve for that. There we are. All right, next up we're gonna remove the valve cover. Bunch of 10 mils going all the way around. Whoa, it's milky. Yeah, definitely a head gasket. All right, taking a look under the valve cover of this 2ZR engine, you'll see here that we do have variable valve timing on the intake. But it looks like there was space for one of the exhausts, but they excluded that. You'll see that the cam caps are one piece that go right across, cover all the bearings. And you also see that there's a little roller system here where the cam is going to touch the roller. And then there's a hydraulically actuated lifter at the back there, which is going to take up any slack so you don't have to do valve adjustment. Condition otherwise looks pretty good. This engine was well taken care of with the exception of the slush that's just built up everywhere. It's got like a milky, oily kind of residue. That definitely was not avoided. The previous owner told me they took really good care of this. 290,000 kilometers. Now this being a Lexus Prius, you have to be cautious of the environment, which means that you have to take some of that poisonous gases and bring it back to the intake to get reburned. And in that sense, you'll see this pipe here is going to come through this cooler with all these little caps on it, which will cool that exhaust gas down. And then this valve is going to regulate how it goes into the intake through this port over here. Now these can definitely clog up with a lot of carbon and cause a lot of issues, especially when it's shooting that down straight into your intake. But luckily this engine is port injected, which means that at least the valves on the inside there should be clean. I'm going to remove the 12s in the back here so we can get this EGR off. So we got studs going in this way, we got studs going in this way, so it's kind of a short circuit here. I can't really get anything out, so I'm just gonna have to take the studs off. I mean, they could have just well used bolts then at that point. These are E-Torx E8 to get the studs out. There we go. There usually is like a water manifold, but this is actually built into the block, which I like because you don't have any extra gaskets or anything that would fail. You have your lower radiator hose, which is attached here. This looks like a heater core hose and then your coolant temperature sensor. Very simple. And here we've got the exhaust manifold and the most expensive stolen catalytic converter would usually bolt up to here. It surprisingly did not integrate this manifold into the head. I'm going to see if I can get these rusty bolts off. Just pop that guy off. The exhaust manifold is a 12 millimeter. I'm going to break these free. Finally, I got two 14s here. This is actually a four to one exhaust manifold, not a four, two, and then one. Such a simple engine. We just got a bunch of 12s and 10s to get the cam caps off. Things are so sticky. It's kind of like when you wake up on a Thursday afternoon. This engine is so simple to work on. Next, we're gonna to move to the front of the engine where we have this electric water pump. That uh, was very uh, undramatic. Now these water pumps have to be electric because of the start-stop system when you're in electric mode for this hybrid. This has to turn in order to circulate fluid, not just really through the engine block, but mostly to cool other hybrid components. To all you fellow technicians, I feel your pain. Why couldn't they move this like three millimeters more and I could get the socket on there? Wish me luck, this stud is an eight mil. Now I'm gonna remove these bolts. And I'll remove that engine mount block. So here we've got the oil filter housing as well as the cartridge over here which is made of plastic. Now back in the 2000s they used to make this out of metal but now they switched it over to plastic which has a tendency to uh, well behave like plastic and crack. I'm gonna remove the 12s and hold it onto the timing chain cover. Oh no drama no oil this thing's empty I like that. Next up I'm gonna remove all the 12 millimeter bolts that hold this timing cover on. There's a couple of 14s and 10s in there but most of them are 12s. I think I got most of them out of there. Oh, I was supposed to take out the timing chain tensioner from the side here. Very milky inside, check this out. And there you can see the timing chain tensioner that you're supposed to slip out from that side. So here we have it, this is the timing setup on the 2ZR FXE engine. Very simple, very easy. 
you got one little chain that goes down to the oil pump inside of the sump and then you've got this timing chain over here that goes straight up to the two camshafts very simple just two slides one on the opposite side and one on the tensioner side the tensioner is already out so we should be able to relax this chain here and get it off kind of a thin chain but this engine doesn't make that much power anyway well in here i'll just remove the camshafts Again, very simple camshaft, pretty lightweight. And then this timing chain slide. Just gonna remove these two 12s here, slide off. And you see Toyota is nice because they're using metal slides with this friction surface being plastic. This is how you're supposed to do it. Ahem, Audi and Volkswagen and BMW and whoever else is doing this. If you make the whole thing out of plastic, of course, it'll be brittle. And back at the top of the engine here, you'll see that this camshaft carrier is actually a separate piece that has the cam bearings where they ride up on. Just two 12 millimeter bolts. So here's a better view of this little roller. You'll see this here is what rolls against the camshaft, which moves up and down. When this moves up and down, it's going to push on that valve to move it up and down. Now to take off the slack between the two, you have this little cup here, which is secured to the hydraulic lifter. And that is actually pushed up by oil pressure, which is running inside of the oil galley along the length of this head. So I'm going to actually collect all of these. And I'll just put them in a box. And if anybody wants them, let me know. You can have them as a desk ornament or a conversation piece. Or you can be like me, just throw them at your brother when he's not looking. Just take off this cam carrier here. It's so sticky. Now I learned my engine with the last two GRFE engine tearing on. Make sure you get the right head bolt socket for Toyota and Lexus. It's not an M12 triple square and I tried using a hex before and that's how I stripped it. You have to use a bi-hexagon 12.10 millimeter socket. I break the head bolts free here. Alright, now I'm going to zip these bolts free should be able to get this head off. The head gasket's so blown it's stuck on there or what? Okay, let me try it upright. Let's get these head bolts out of here. After a little bit of encouraging, I got it to pop free. All right, check it out. I'm gonna take off the gasket here. And I can already see that this was the piston here where it was leaking into. Basically all the coolant from around here is leaking into the cylinder. And if you compare that to the other three, this is sparkling clean. Now that's not normal for an engine that has 290,000 kilometers on it. That's because it was burning coolant. And because it was burning coolant, it was basically steam cleaning that piston. Sometimes it takes a tiny little failure point between the coolant jacket for some coolant to leak inside of there. And that's it. You start burning coolant and eventually losing compression. And in this case, you can see there's those slight burn marks between these two cylinders over here. So that indicates that there's a loss of compression between that cylinder and I bet this cylinder was probably also affected. Some of the coolant from that jacket in that hole over there likely made it into the cylinder through this little point over here. And you're probably going to see the same thing on the head. Now it's time to rotate the engine to work on the oil pan. Now if there's any mess in here, I ran and I got my old Canada 150 shirt from 2017. And I also found my wife's dress that was hanging in the bathroom when she was showering. So I'll just have that on hand here, just in case it makes a mess. That was disappointing. Only when you're prepared, then it doesn't happen. Nice to see that they're just using a very basic stamped steel oil pan. While it's susceptible to rust, it's pretty cheap and easy to replace. Ooh, nice and clean in here. Except here that has a lot of that milky stuff. That's really clean. And that's what happens when you run coolant through the oiling system. It cleans out everything. So no, coolant doesn't do a good job of lubricating and that's why you shouldn't have it in your oiling system. You can see how sticky it is. I wonder if someone could rebrand coolant as some of that Marvel mystery stuff that like magically cleans out your engine. So here we've got the oil pump. It's driven off of that chain in the front there. And the oil pickup tube, which is pretty clean. There's no debris or anything in there. So this engine was actually pretty healthy before the head gasket failure. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the 12 millimeter bolts that hold it on. Get the 14 off here. And then I can remove the pump. And I can remove this little gear here. Such a tiny, it's a tiny cute little chain. Smaller than my tricycle. Wait, my tricycle doesn't have a chain. Next up, there's a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts going all the way around the upper oil pan. Squeaky clean. This engine's so small, I'm gonna have to zoom in for this one. Take a look at the bottom end of the 2ZR engine. You can see things here are very simple. We just got our five main bearings and our four connecting rods for each connecting rod and piston. I think they are pretty clean. There's not much tarnish, and that's probably a fact that coolant ran through here, cleaned everything up. But also, the previous owner told me that they took really good care of this engine with oil changes. Here's the rear main seal, it's just a pressed in design. No bolt on. All right, now I'm just gonna loosen off the connecting rods. These are a 10 millimeter 12 point socket. Take a look at the connecting rods here. See what the bearings look like. Clean, that's amazing. Clean, clean, 
clean. Just amazing quality. 290,000 kilometers and there's not even a proper scratch on there. Not even the coating is worn off or anything. And look at how polished these crank bearing journals look. Next I'm going to remove the main bearing caps. These are a 14 millimeter 12 point socket. Wow, those are brand new. So clean. Check out how good those main cap bearings are. This crankshaft is shiny. I'll just remove that. Let's go ahead and remove these pistons. This is going to be my cleanest engine teardown ever. There's your problem. And here we got all the pistons out and this was the one that had the failure. You can see it's squeaky clean. All right, so here's my rant. Here's the piston. You can see we've got our two compression rings on the top like a normal piston. However, take a look at that oil control ring. You can see it's like a, almost a one piece design. It's so small and tiny compared to like a normal one. Where's the oil supposed to flow? Now the reason they did this, they switched over to 0W20 and 0W16 weight oil. So you got a lot thinner oil and theoretically a lot less friction and theoretically thinner oil can flow through that kind of oil control ring. In reality, it does not flow through that. That thing's basically clogging it up. When this piston is sliding down, most of that oil is going to just come back right into the piston at the top here and get burned out through the exhaust. Bad, bad design, lots of oil burning, and that's why this engine has a lot of oil burning problems. On the other hand, here is a normal modern piston. You can see here the oil control ring actually has three pieces. There's a top, a bottom, and that corrugated section, which has lots of space for oil to flow in. Therefore, the oil will flow through and flow back down on its downstroke and not end up in the top of the combustion chamber over here where it burns out through the exhaust. Obviously, with any engine, lack of maintenance is going to cause carbon to build up and these things will clog up and it'll only be more so with an oil control ring design like those low tension rings over there. Yeah, we know oil burning is bad for the environment. It's pretty expensive and it also eats out your catalytic converters, which on a Prius is really expensive to replace. But moreover, oil burning is really bad because people are simply stupid they don't know how to check their oil these days then their engine blows up because it runs out of oil and ends up on my youtube channel for a teardown video all right that's the end of my rant i'm gonna get this block off the stand here and we're gonna go take a look at the rest of the engine so here we've got the engine all torn down. Let's have a close look at some of the components to see how they work. Starting at the bottom of the engine, this is the upper oil pan. You see the oil pump is going to bring in fluid up to here. And that's going to take it over to the timing cover, which is going to drag it back around this way through to the oil filter. Now that is one thing I don't like because you got extra O-rings here where oil is just passing through the timing cover. I don't really see why the timing cover has to play an integral role in the oil lubrication system and cause the potential for oil leaks here. Oil filter is a cartridge style oil filter with a stupid plastic housing here, which I I hate because it always breaks. Actually, this looks like a doorman symbol. It looks like this has actually been replaced. It probably broke before. It's not an OE. It doesn't say Toyota on it. This thing is very really simple. Just oil in and oil out. All right, here we got the oil pump. Gonna take it apart. It's a bunch of 10 mils. Just a simple gear type oil pump. This piece basically sits inside of here and it rotates. I was actually expecting a little bit more carnage in here. Anyway, the way this oil pump works is we've got the pickup tube here, which is going to bring oil into this compartment. You can see this is going to provide fluid flow as it rotates over here with this gear mechanism. And that fluid is going to flow over here to the output, which goes inside to the block. This here is a fluid pressure regulator. And if the fluid pressure exceeds, it's just going to short circuit it back around to the other side. The rest of the lubrication system of this engine is pretty straightforward. We've got the filter oil, which is going to run down through the block over here and then into this cross drill hole, which runs the length of the entire block. Block. Now the oil galley that runs that length is going to feed these little sprayers here which are going to coat the cylinder walls with oil and the crankshaft bearings are going to tap off of that to get oil pressure. And once again one thing I don't like is that this little hole on the front of the block is now going to feed back the timing chain cover. Again timing chain covers like to leak and you could lose oil pressure here. That's where your oil pressure switch is located. You've also got this galley inside of here that goes to a couple of holes on the head and it also feeds the hydraulic chain tensioner which is externally accessed. That means when you time this engine you put the cover on and then you put the tensioner in and release it. Now on the side of the block we have the knock sensor but we've also got the PCV valve and instead of coming off of the valve cover it actually comes from where it should be the actual crankcase itself. Looking at the top of the block here you'll see that it's an open deck design very simple and straightforward there's no need for extra reinforcement or a semi closed block design because this engine doesn't even make 100 horsepower. It's a very low stress engine but it's also very efficient due to its Atkinson cycle timing setup. The problem with these early 2ZR hybrid engines engines is that they go through a lot of heat cycling because of that start stop system. Sometimes you're on battery electric, then sometimes you're back on the engine and the engine has to warm back up again, then it cools back down when you're in traffic. All that heat cycling is going to take its stress on these dissimilar metals and then you're going to have a little head gasket failure. Mechanically speaking, mostly from a design perspective, things look okay. I mean, it 
it's a Corolla engine after all, without that heat cycling, a lot of these issues would have been alleviated. Now Atkinson cycle means that you're going to leave these valves open just a little bit after combustion, which is great because it's going to suck in some of that gasoline air and reburn it so you're getting the most use out of the fuel that you're given. Obviously you're not going to make that much power because you're not pushing all that air out. Now the head design is very straightforward with four valves per cylinder with your intake and exhaust valves. The spark plugs do look like this engine was burning a tad of oil. They're kind of a brownish color. If it wasn't really for this head gasket fail, you could probably slap a head gasket on it and send it on. But with the oil burning issue that's very common on these, I probably would have done a ring job. It's also pretty evident that the cylinder one was burning coolant because it's significantly cleaner than the other cylinder. Now it's a bit difficult to see in the intake ports. You do have a lot of carbon on the outside, but if you actually look inside, you'll see that the valves themselves are pretty clean. And that's due to the port injector, which is what you have up here, which pretty much washes off the back of the valves. And then you don't really need to do that periodic carb cleaning services to your intake as you would if it had direct injection. Now taking a look here, you'll remember that there's these two oil holes that come from the timing chain cover that's going to bring oil up to the top here and over here to power the variable valves timing system that sits on top here. But it's also going to bring oil into this contraption over here, which is your cam bearings, and that's going to spread the oil from here down across to either side, and that's going to bring the oil across to the oil galleys that power these hydraulic lifters on either side for the intake and the exhaust. Now here you can see the oil galleys that come around each side here. They have these hydraulic lifters which are going to take up slack between the roller that sits over here so you don't have to do valve adjustments. That's great. And up at the top here we have that cam bearing that feeds into the valve cover which has your VVTi solenoid and the cam actuator which would sit on the intake side only on this engine. Here's a look under the valve cover. You can see it actually is pretty tarnished but it's also kind of milky because of that coolant that mixed inside. Anyways, here's the feed for the variable valve timing solenoid that sits on the back of this thing over inside of here. Remember it's only on the intake side for this engine. You also see that there's a little hole over here that feeds this pipe network that runs along the length here and that's just to provide more oil across the top of the valve train. Now as I've ranted before the main issue with these engines were these really thin low tension rings. You can see this here is the oil ring. It's like a one piece unit and then you have this little spring that sits behind it and what happens after a little while is carbon starts to build up and these rings are just too thin and they can't handle it and you end up burning oil because there's nowhere for that oil to go. This thing is just so thin it's like a piece of string. Now Toyota issued technical service bulletins for not only this engine but the 2AZ engine which also used to burn oil but who really keeps their car in warranty? Most of these Toyotas end up being really high mileage before it starts to burn a lot of oil. Now EGR was also a common issue on one of these. This part here is the cooler and this part here is the actual valve itself. And you can see there's a little bit of stuff built up inside of there, kind of flaky. And what would happen is if these do carb up, it's just going to attenuate your oil burning problem. You basically have more and more oil being burnt up, thrown back into the engine and it's just going to close loop that cycle. Not very good. Honestly, if there was a way or a method, I'd probably cut off the EGR completely and try to disable it in the system. Or if there was like a resistor hack or something, I think that would be a lot easier because oil burning is not exactly good for the environment either. And neither is EGR when it fails. Now, I read somewhere that these water pumps are actually a pretty good failure point on these hybrid engines. And these might actually be worth a couple of bucks. I wonder what I should do with this. I mean, if you bought a Toyota because of the quality, Check out that crankshaft. It's absolutely clean after almost 300,000 kilometers. That's pretty good stuff. But if you bought a Toyota Prius because you thought there would be no maintenance, you better half the amount of the 16,000 kilometer oil change intervals because that's part of the problem here. And if you got one of these engines, make sure you pay attention to the oil and coolant levels. And if it is starting to go, you might as well put new rings in it while you're in there to the updated version that supposedly fixed this issue. Well, make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.